Hey guys, welcome back to Cisco Nate. And today's video is going to focus on deploying ASAV into AWS and enabling remote access VPN. So this video is intended to be a soup to nuts video that will show you virtually every step you need to go from not knowing how to configure or get the software to downloading it, installing it, configuring RA VPN. And in my opinion, it's one of the fastest ways possible to do it. I know of no other that is faster. And in this video, uh, the requirements are going to be pretty simple. There's quite a few of them, though. You're going to need a CCO ID for Cisco. You're going to need a smart account for Cisco. And you're going to need a virtual account for Cisco. If you don't know what these are or don't have them, stop now because you won't be able to complete the rest of this. Go to your PSS or CSS at Cisco and ask them to enable or create those for you. And then come back and pick up where you left off in the video. The next few things you're going to need are an Amazon account, preferably one that's already verified and has billable information on it so you can spin up these instances, and PuTTY in this case to do it as shown in the video. I use PuTTY and PuTTY Gen is what you'll need to do the pre-placed key to access these devices via SSH in AWS. Okay, so first things first, I want to talk a little bit about the architecture of AWS and building these virtual constructs in AWS. It is important to understand the terminology that they use, such as VPCs, subnets, network ACLs, security groups, interfaces, internet gateways. All of this stuff is relevant to understanding how and why we're configuring what we do as we go along these steps here. So I'm going to switch over to a quick whiteboard so you guys can kind of see what I'm doing here. And we're going to start off with uh, drawing, I guess, a big kind of oval to represent AWS. I'm going to kind of label these constructs as we do it. So here's AWS. And ultimately, our goal inside of AWS is to spin up our ASAV. So I'm going to go ahead and label the ASAV here, too. Now, the first thing you do when deploying ASAV is you spin up your VPC. And VPC is the virtual construct inside of AWS that houses your subnets, your networks, your interfaces, your instances, which are your servers or machines or appliances, whatever you're spinning up. So we'll go ahead and label our VPC and we'll just say it's VPC one. And once we get our appliance up and running in there, one of the first things we do is we attach an interface here. And that interface is named, in this case, it is management. And that management interface has what's called a subnet attached to it. Now, the subnet for the VPC is typically something like 10.0.0.0/16, a very large subnet. And then as you attach interfaces and assign subnets, i.e. networks, to these interfaces, you break it down further and you subnet, right? So let's say our management is going to be 10.0.0.24. And uh, ultimately, after we get this instance up and running with the management interface, we can go in and configure a few things. We add a few more interfaces, like our outside interface. I'm going to label it out here. And our inside interface, which is what attaches to or connects to any of our servers or services and machines behind this. So I'm just going to call it in. And then once again, we of course assign out of that slash 16 a subnet. So I'm going to say 10.0.1.0 slash 24. And the inside, we're going to say 10.0.2.0 slash 24. Just grabbing the first three slash 24 subnets. Now, in general, this is kind of the basic build at. The last thing we need to do here is give each of these a way to talk to the internet on the public facing subnet. So our management is one of the public facing subnets we want to be able to reach into. And our outside, of course, is where the production traffic flows to and through the ASA. So I'm going to label this IGW here. <clears throat> and so that's IGW1. And then we have IGW2, Internet Gateway 2. And each of these has a separate and distinct public IP. I'm just going to make up a number here. It's not even a real IP. But I'll just do it for the sake of simplicity here. <clears throat> All right, so each of these IPs are tied intimately to the IGW. And what you need to understand with the IGWs is that the IP that is assigned here is intimately tied to this interface. So any traffic that hits this IP goes to the management interface. Any traffic that hits this IP goes to the outside interface. 
this is the basic build out that we're going to achieve here. There's two more things that we need to understand that are very important, and they are network ACLs <coughs> and security groups. Now, if any of you have seen these in AWS, they look like they do the same thing. They control IPs and ports that are able to traverse your network and or reach your interfaces. And the nuance there very specifically is network ACLs are tied to the network. So think of this subnet as a bunch of virtual routers and switches that pass traffic from here to here or from here to here. And those network ACLs literally only allow whatever you allow. Now by default, the network ACLs are typically wide open, allow anything. And then there's an explicit deny anything, but the allow comes first. So by default, your network ACLs are wide open. The security groups, on the other hand, act just like the network ACLs, but specifically for your interfaces. So they act almost like a host-based firewall. I can have my network ACL completely open and have a security group tied to this interface that says only allow port 22 SSH, and that is indeed what the defaults are for AWS. So the traffic that comes in will be allowed through all this virtual infrastructure and then get denied unless it's SSH when it hits this interface because of the security group. Now we can modify both of those or one or the other, but these are things we have to keep in mind because we will be modifying them as we go through this exercise. So that's about it for the AWS overall architecture. This is my understanding. I may have used some terminology wrongly if you go to an AWS architect but this is enough to get you started and understand where we are going to go. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and download the software we need here. I'm gonna go ahead and open a Chrome browser, navigate to software.cisco.com. At this point, you log in, use your two-factor authentication, thanks Duo. <coughs> All right, and to download the software we need, you click on software download. Now you see up here, I've already downloaded this software that we need, which is AnyConnect Software Mobility Client 4.x, but most of you may not have. So you come down here to the select a product and type in search bar AnyConnect. And what that'll do is it'll bring up some breadcrumbs for you. Now you can hit enter or conversely, you can just let it continue to run the search directly on the screen. So I'm gonna show you what that looks like here. And you can click on next your mobility client and then follow the breadcrumbs down to the latest version, which is 4.x. Now we're going to use the latest release, which is 4.8.0.3.0.3.6. And what you'll notice on the downloads page is there's multiple different versions of the packages because AnyConnect is built for Linux, Mac, and Windows. And then there's two different versions of each of those platform installs. And that is pre-deploy which is the one you install on workstations or use some sort of software management like SCCM to deploy on the workstations. And then there's web deploy, i.e. head end. And that is the one that you install on Firepower or ISE or ASA so that as clients connect, they can then download and install it. Now I'm using Windows for this uh, presentation. So I'm gonna go ahead and find the Windows uh, web deploy uh, package, which is down here, the Windows web deploy. And we're going to go ahead and download that. Click Accept and License Agreement. Now, some of you may see a prompt here about strong encryption. You have to prove that you are not from certain countries and attest that you're either with the federal government or commercial entity within the U.S. Just click through all that, hit Accept, and you can see the package is finished downloading here. All right, after downloading the software there, we'll go ahead and move on to PuTTY. Just type putty in your browser. It's chiark.greenend.org.uk. We'll uh, download the latest version, 0.73. And uh, you'll see a bunch of different things here. The putty package is a whole bunch of utilities put together. It comes with a pre-made installer MSI file for Windows. Uh, so you click the 32 or 64 bit appropriate for your system. I always install via the MSI. It'll install everything. The only two pieces we really need if you want to be specific is putty and putty gen. So I'm going to go ahead and download the MSI installer. I already have PuTTY installed, but you know what? I'm just going to walk through this as if I'm one of you guys. I'm hit next. I'll hit repair. We'll go ahead and do a repair. It'll refresh everything. Good to go. All right, so now that we've downloaded this software that we need, both AnyConnect for the web deploy and PuTTY, we're going to go ahead and get into the AWS configuration here. So I'm going to sign into the console. 
And typically I fire up two things, VPC and EC2 instance consoles. It makes it easier. So the first thing I wanna do is launch my VPC wizard. And you always wanna start with a single public subnet because the rest of them are more complicated and you'll end up doing more reconfiguring than if you just started off with a single public subnet. So we'll go ahead and hit select, gave us 10.0.0.16 as before and 10.0.0.0 slash 24 is what's going to be assigned to our first interface, which is our management interface. I'm going to go ahead and click Create VPC here, and we have launched VPC. Now, along with our ASAV here, so I'm going to call this ASAV2, everything is going to be prepended with 2 so that we don't get confused here. Uh, the next thing we're going to move on to is the network interfaces that we need and are going to use for this. And because of the network interfaces, we're also going to need security groups and route tables, internet gateways, all sorts of stuff. So first thing I'm going to start with is security groups. I'm going to pretend like we are creating ASAV2 inside security group, ASAV2 in. And I'm going to associate it with ASAV2 instance. This security group is responsible for our inside interface of the new ASA instance. And I'm going to do the same thing for both the outside, ASA v2 out, outside SG, associate with our new VPC. And then it's already created a new default uh, security group for our management interface. So I have to figure out which one it is, which is not so nice. So ASAV2 is tied to this VPC DDA. There we go. This is our ASAV2. So I named these, but the names don't quite show up. So I'm going to come back here and replicate these out just to make it easier. Out. ASAV2. ASAV2 in. I'm gonna create my own new security group for the management interface, and I just want this to do this for consistency, ASAV2 MGMT. It is critical that you keep these names very consistent because when you have multiple VPCs instances, it can get very confusing. MGMT, SG, we're gonna attach that to our DDA ASAV2. Okay, so we created all the security groups that we're gonna need, ASAV2. GMT. <clears throat> Next thing down the road is all of the subnets we're going to need. And this is important to have so that we can associate it properly with our new instance uh, for the inside and outside and all that. So this is our DDA. This is our new uh, VPC. I'm going to rename this now so we don't get confused. ASA V2. And this is our management subnet. Let me make that clear there. Sub. I want to create a new subnet. ASA v2 outside subnet. ASA v2. And we're going to call the outside 10.0.1.0 slash 24. Next, we're going to create the inside subnet. ASA v2 in sub associate that with our ASA v2 VPC 10.0.2.0 slash 24. Create that. So now we have our inside, outside, and management subnet for ASA v2. That's great. Next thing we need to do is make sure we have route tables for each of these. So I have a new route table associated with our instance, and it should say it's associated with instance DDA2. This is it here. So I'm going to give this a name, ASAV2 default, as not currently associated with anything. I'm going to create a new route table. Let's see what this one here is associated with. DDA2. Ah, that's associated with our management subnet. Notice it says subnet, all right, uh, associate with the uh, DDA2 and it's this subnet. So that's management. So we're gonna go ahead and name that ASA v2 GMT route table default RT. All right, I'm gonna create two more route tables. 
And this is important because you are going to need specific default routes for the outside in the management. So ASAV2 outside RT, associate that with our ASAV2. Default management outside, and I'm gonna create an inside just for the heck of it. ASAV2 in RT, associate that with our ASAV2. Good. Now, thinking from a routing and reachability perspective, the management route table will need to be able to talk to the local subnet and everything else in the world. So it needs to be connected to the IGW, and it is. That's great. So everything else goes to the IGW, uh, local is local. We need to replicate that on the outside route table, which we will have to associate at some point. So I'm going to go ahead and edit routes. I'm going to add a route, 0, 0, 0, 0 slash zero. We'll go ahead and set that up to the internet gateway, the only one that we have. Oh, you know what? It doesn't, let me verify that our internet gateway is hooked up. Ah, good, okay. So, DDA2, 756 is the internet gateway we need. All right, we're gonna come back and finish this configuration. Add routes, zero, 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 slash zero. Internet gateway, 756, perfect. All right, so now the outside route table allows traffic out properly, or knows how to route traffic, not allows. That's the role of ACLs or security groups. The management uh, does the same thing. The inside is only local, and the default is only local, and that's, that's okay. But now we also need to associate the outside subnet with the outside route table. And because I use these wonderful names, we know which side is the outside subnet. Perfect. Same thing with the inside. Let's move up and do the inside. Associate that with the inside subnet because we have these wonderful names. You know which one that is. Save. So now inside is associated with the subnet. Management is and outside is associated with the subnet. The default is not and that is perfectly okay. We have an internet gateway. We have subnets. Uh, we're doing good here. <coughs> we have our security groups. Perfect. Now we can move on to actually creating and plugging in uh, these interfaces. But in order to do so, we need our ASAV fired up. So let's move over to EC2 now that we've built out all the constructs we will basically need for the rest of this. Let's go to launch an instance. Head over to the marketplace, ASAV. We're gonna go with BYOL, that's bring your own license. You have the ability to run an appliance that already has a license associated with it, and that costs a premium because you're paying for use of the license as well as the device. If you have your own license in your smart account, which is what I'm showing you here, this is the way you want to go. So we'll go ahead and hit select here. These are all the instance types. We're just gonna run with C5X large. It's a little responsive. We'll hit continue. And then we'll scroll down and select C5 X large. Configure instance details. It's associated with our V2 instance and our V2 management subnet. That's perfect. We'll go ahead and scroll all the way down. It's going to automatically connect our management interface and auto sign IP. And then it has this thing called user data. Now you may hear zero day config or user data used interchangeably. And what that is, is it's a startup config you can plug into this device for the very first time it's launched. So I have a zero day startup config, which does minimal stuff like configuring the management interface, allowing inter area traffic and setting up NTP and in some cases DNS. Now DNS is always going to be the dot two of your public subnet. Now, even though we haven't started up this uh, ASA yet, we do know our public subnet on the management side is 10.0.0.0. So in our zero day config, we can replace this with 10.0.0.2 and remove the commenting. So now we will actually have a DNS server in our zero day config. Now it's worth noting, you can start this instance without configuring that and you will still be able to reach it via SSH because the management interface will always be configured, regardless whether you put this in here or not. But it helps to do some pre-configuration for later on with DNS, etc. So I'm gonna hit review and launch. We don't need additional uh, storage and we're gonna launch again. Now, we're gonna to have to create a key pair and this is what we need Putty Gen for. AWS forces you to use a pre-placed key to authenticate to their uh, 
uh, to the appliances launched within the AWS cloud. So we're gonna create a new key pair and we're gonna call this SAV2 key. And this is gonna create a .pem file. So we're gonna download the key pair and hit launch. All right, so that's gonna be launching here. Um, and in order to log into this device, we need to create the PPK, which putty we'll use. So let's close this here. And we're gonna go ahead and launch our putty, which we downloaded and installed earlier, specifically putty gen. It's as simple as clicking load, changing your filter to all in your downloads. You should have that PEM file, which we just downloaded, hit open. It's going to open and con uh, convert this key to a PPK if you save private key. Uh, I'm gonna leave it without a passphrase. Best practice is to have a passphrase. It just makes this easier to do it without one for demonstration. Save private key. And we're gonna name it the same thing, ASAV2-key. Now it's okay to name it the same thing because the extension is different. It will be labeled .ppk and when hit save, that's all we need to do for now with that. We'll come back here and at this point, our instance should be launched. Ah, so it's still initializing, that's okay. <coughs> we'll wait till it finishes coming online. And there's some important things we need to do once it is online, uh, and that is creating and attaching these network interfaces that we want to use uh, the rest of the time on this ASA. So while it's initializing, I'll just go ahead and do that. We'll come over to our EC2 instance uh, console, click on network interfaces. These were some of the old ones I used for the old instance. I'm going to create a new network interface here and to be clear I'm going to name it ASAV2 and I'm going to call it inside in interface. The inside interface is on the 1002 subnet and because I've got these names in here again very important when you have multiple things I know which one to click on without having to do a lot of homework. And I'm going to associate that subnet with the inside security group I created for the ASAV2. This is why this nomenclature and labeling and naming is extremely important. So I've got that network interface up and running and I'm gonna call this again, ASAV2 in interface. Create a new interface here, ASAV2 out interface. I'm gonna link that to my ASA v2 outside subnet and ASA v2 outside security group. ASA v2 out interface. And we already have the management one. It's one of these here. And what we can do is we can look at, in this case, it's made very easy just by the zone. So my Original ASA was launched in East 1C. This new one, ASA v2, is in 1F. So I know this is my management interface, the default one that was stood up. So ASA v2, MGMT, int. All right. <clears throat> okay. The last thing we need to do is go to our VPC and we want to attach our route tables. Oh, we already have a route tables attached to the subnets. What we can do while we're waiting for it to start up is make sure that we have our security groups set up the right way for these ACLs. So on the ASA v2 outside interface, I'm planning on allowing SSL remote access VPN and web traffic. Now web traffic is important because it allows them to connect and download the AnyConnect client. So on my inbound rules for the outside interface, I'm gonna edit the rules, I'm gonna add the TCP rule for port 22 from everything allow SSL RA VPN and add another custom TCP rule allow 443 i.e. HTTPS from anyone allow HTTPS and we're gonna hit save rules. Now, on my management interface, we want to allow two things inbound. We want to allow SSH
from anywhere. And we want to allow 443 web traffic so that they can connect and download and use ASDM. And try to label these so you remember later when you go back, why did I do this? What was this for? And then on ASAV2 in, uh, inbound rules, uh, you want to allow, remember this is tied from the perspective of the interface. So inbound, i.e. going from your servers to and through the ASA to the outside world, you want to allow everything. So all TCP, allow them to talk to anything, allow all out. And I'm saying that because you're talking from perspective of the inside subnet inbound to the inside interface, you want to allow all the traffic to hit the ASA to reach the outside world. So I got my inside, my management, my outside, and then there's a default for ASAV2, which is allow all either way. <clears throat> okay, cool. So we got our security groups uh, created and they should be allowing the proper traffic. We got our route tables, which should allow our routing to work properly. Let's go back and see if our instance is up and running. Ah, it is. Okay. So if I've done all of this right, the last thing we need to do is come up here and add our Elastic IPs to our instance. So the EC2 console, Elastic IPs, we want to allocate two Elastic IPs, okay? One of these is going to be linked to the management of our new ASA, and one of them is going to be linked to the outside interface. So I'm going to hit allocate. We'll go ahead and give it a name real quick. Actually, you know what? I'll go ahead and associate Elastic IP. We want to give it network interface. And because I gave these wonderful names, we have them listed here. So the management interface is the one we want first. That's the only IP associated with the management interface. Awesome. I'll associate it. And then I want to allocate one more. And then associate that additional one to another network interface. And this again, instead of management, is to the outside because we want to be able to reach it for remote access VPN and for downloading any kind. So associate. So at this point, I should be able to come up to my instance, should be able to click on my new ASA v2 instance. I want to label this here ASA v2. I now have a DNS name tied to a public IP, which allows me to reach it. And I should be able to, through this DNS name and or IP, SSH into this device. In order to do that, I now need to configure my PuTTY. And using that key that I created before, I'm going to SAV2. I'm going to come down to my SSH auth. We need to take that PPK that we generated in the auth here. Come back up and we're going to save this session. Using DNS, I should be able to reach this via SSH, which is successful. I've got a new key now. The default username is admin as configured. That's in my zero day config and you can change that. You can also change it after the fact. Try to hit enable for the first time. We have to change or create our enable password. If I do a show run, I should be able to see that I have a management interface and all that NTP and DNS configuration that was initially configured should be working. Now at this point, I should be able to say ping management 8.8.8.8 to make sure routing is working and ping management www.google.com. Now this is important because I want to make sure DNS work is working and that's critical for smart licensing later down the road. Now what you will notice is, hey, we only have our management interface up here. What about the rest of them? What about being able to connect to it externally? We created those network interfaces previously, but what we did not do after we created them was we did not attach them. You can see the instance is empty. So I'm gonna go ahead and click attach and I wanna select ASA v2 
and give it time to attach that interface. Now, the first interface I attached was the outside. That means the first interface on the ASA, TE00, will be the outside interface. And then I'm going to attach the, quote, inside. We'll hit attach here. And I should give it a minute. Now, if I do show run, you'll notice something here. You don't see those interfaces. That is because once they are attached in AWS, you need to restart the instance for it to mount and recognize those new interfaces. So I'm going to type reload here. We're going to type yes to save reload. There we go. So it's going to kick me out. I'll just go ahead and close it. And we can come back to our instances here to watch the status of the instance. It looks from AWS's perspective like it is running. As this continues to reboot, we'll just check it periodically through PuTTY and it should be fairly quick to come back online. Not up yet. We'll just continue waiting and keep checking back. All right, so we're still waiting. We'll go ahead and check back one more time here. Let's go through putty. Is AV2. Oh, there we are. It's back up. Admin, use my PPK. And then I'll go enable. All right, so I know it's back up and running. I'm going to log in. If I do show run now, look at that. We now have physical interfaces, quote unquote, on this virtual appliance. So I'm going to maximize this just to make it easier. Now we have some configuration to do. You think about our construct, we've got our VPCs, our interfaces, our subnets, our elastic IPs, uh, all of this stuff happening. We got our management interface fully configured. Remember the interface 10.0.0 is our outside. So I'm gonna go config T, say no, int TE00. I'm gonna give it a name if. I'm gonna use the reserves name if outside should automatically set my security level to save me some configuration. I'm then going to give it IP address, and we need to go back to <coughs> our view here under the instance and look at our network interfaces to find out what the outside IP is for this guy. It is 10.01.104. Now, AWS has that IP assigned, but that doesn't push it into the appliance, and the appliance IP and AWS IP have to match. So I'm configuring the outside interface. I need to make it match the IP here. 10.01.104. 10.01.104 on a slash 24. Last thing you need to do, and don't forget, is no shut. So that interface is now connected and up and running on the ASA. I'm going to switch over to 10 gig 01, which is our inside. I'm going to give it a name if. Inside should set the security level and save me some typing. IP address. And we need to do the same thing. Come back down here, look at our inside interface, 10.02.43 on a slash 24. Okay, so I've got DNS working. I've got my inside and outside interfaces configured with IPs. I've got my route tables. I've got my security groups and then my network ACLs, my internet gateways, my elastic IPs. Uh, the last thing I need to do is actually configure the routing on the ASA side. So config T, route outside 0000. And the gateway on every subnet that you stand up in AWS is always dot one. It's not well documented or easy to find sometimes. So 10.0.0.1, or it's 10.0.1.1. So that's my outside default route. Now the management already has that inserted so you don't have to worry about it. And so let's think about our services that we now want to start testing and enabling. The first thing I need to do is I need to be able to get into this device via ASDM. ASDM requires an HTTP server to be running on the management interface. So I wanna type HTTP server enable. And then HTTP, so that enables the server. Now I have to tell it which interface and from who or who from can access it. So HTTP, I want to say anybody, typically you'd like this down to your management workstation, management. And this will allow me to log in via ASDM to this device. Now later down the road, we also want to have HTTP enabled 
On the outside interface, again, locked down typically to the clients you expect for remote access VPN. And the reason we want the web browser enabled is so that people can connect and download the AnyConnect client that is appropriate for their machine. So I'm gonna go ahead and type outside now. Mm, let's type it all caps. Okay, so that's HTTP, SSL has already been enabled. Um, I should be good. Let's go ahead and check our routability and ping ability on the outside interface to make sure I didn't screw anything up. Based on our route tables, IPs, ACLs, everything should be good. AWS route tables as well as ASA route tables. That's great. Now I'm gonna ping and make sure DNS is still working for the outside interface. Great, everything is still working. <clears throat> From here, we can finally move into quickly configuring the remote access VPN. So I'm gonna close all the browsers except for the AWS ones. And I'm gonna leave my command prompt window up but uh, we don't really need it. So first things first, I'm gonna go ahead and log into my EC2, my ASAV. I need my management IP. And I'm gonna go ahead and find out what my public IP is here. Here it is. Now I can use the public IP or the public DNS. So I can go to the elastic IP as well and find out which one is connected to my public IP. And it is this one here. And the public DNS name is this. So I can now go to my browser and say HTTPS colon slash slash. So now I can come to my ASA v2 instance and I want to be able to access via the web browser the management interface. One thing I forgot before was I created, because I was very prescriptive about this, a security group specifically for management. And I realized at this time that I never took that security group and associated it with the management interface. By default, when you fire these up, they are associated with, the management interface is associated with the default security group. So if I come back to network interface, I go to the management, you can see it's assigned to that default one. It's got this long name, but if you look it up, that's the default one. So I wanna check this box for management interface and say change security group. And I wanna change it to ASA v2 management. That is the one that allows SSH as well as web traffic. All right, so back to my instances. I check this box. Here's my DNS name. I should be able to copy this to the clipboard. Come up here, open a new browser. And there we are. I am now reaching the management interface. And what it should do is say, oh, by the way, I've got ASDM for you. So I'm gonna go ahead and install the launcher. This right here is why you need specifically password credentials, not just the pre-placed key check. And that is because in order to download this, you need a password and a username. So I'm gonna click keep. Once it's downloaded, I already have it downloaded, but just for the sake of doing exactly what you will be going through, I'm gonna go ahead and run the installer every time I get one. And once it fires up, I'm gonna tell it to just do a repair and that'll force it to reinstall all the components that are already there. So that one's done. Now I've got my launcher and I should be able to use ASDM to now reach into that same IP address, i.e. this DNS name, with the username and password. Again, this is why you need username and password versus just pre-placed key. <coughs> and there we are. We are now logging into the management. Now, the reason ASDM is very nice for this is it is a very, very quick way to install and configure a... SSL based remote access VPN. All right, so we're logged in ASTM. Let's flash back to our CLI real quick and I'm gonna show you how to configure the smart licensing. So we're gonna type license smart register and then it's gonna ask for an ID token. Now you don't have that token yet. We need to come back over to our smart licensing. I'm gonna grab this software.cisco.com. I'm going to click on smart software licensing under my account, you need to make sure your smart account, which is here, is correct. Most of you only have one, so this down arrow will not exist. Click on inventory and then navigate to your virtual account under your smart account. Again, most of you will only have one. You're going to have to click create new token. Make sure that it expires long after you need to use it and that if you want strong encryption, you need to make sure this checkbox is checked. Go ahead and, go ahead and click create token. Copy that token to your clipboard. 
Oh my gosh, get rid of the survey. So control C to copy to clipboard. Come back here and we're gonna click paste. Now, in a second here, it should take only a few seconds for it to reach in and start trying to configure this. We'll have to show license all, see if it is registered. It says it's allowed and says it's succeeded. This is great, license authorization is pending. Now it's gonna take a minute for it to say, hey, you do or you don't have licensing, and that's okay. <clears throat> All right, so our smart license uh, registration should be done by now. I do show license all. Ah, it does say succeeded, but now we need to tell what features we actually want. So configure T, license, smart, feature, tier, standard. This is the only tier you can have, but you have to type this in order to provision it. And then throughput level 2G. All right, so I have now configured smart licensing and it should have, as a result of feature tier standard and throughput level 2G, big T, feature, license, smart, feature, show license all. You should be able to see that the features I have requested down here, are now using a license. It's asking for a 2G uh, license usage. Export status is not restricted, which means I have strong encryption. And the, the throughput, the standard is this and the throughput is this. So this one license gives me what I need here. Okay, so this is now configured. I can go back to the ASDM GUI and we can start working on configuring our remote access VPN. I'm going to go through here and click a network client access. First thing we want to do is upload the AnyConnect client software that we downloaded earlier. So I'm going to say upload. I'm going to say browse local files. I'm going to go to my downloads folder. Choose the AnyConnect image that I downloaded. The web deploy one for Windows say upload file. This is going to upload from my computer to ASDM ASA and then it's going to allow me to choose who to give this file to and I can do that by searching for the registration keys that indicate that Windows is accessing this device. Now since I'm only using Windows I'm only loading the Windows install file for AnyConnect but for anybody else you could load here's the regular expression for matching the Windows um, you can choose to install Linux and Mac OS version of AnyConnect as well, and it will properly identify the device that is connecting and serve it up to them. Now that I've done this, I can go through actually running the wizard. So I'm going to say start a VPN wizard, and we're going to do an AnyConnect VPN wizard. We're going to do SSL because it is the simplest setup and does not require certificates. I'm going to click next. I'm going to call this SSL VPN. We're going to do it to the outside interface. I'm going to choose the protocols only SSL. We do not need a device certificate. Here's the client images that we just uploaded. Authentication methods are local. I'm going to leave it at that and use my admin credentials. We don't need SAML. Client address. So we do want to create a virtual IP address pool, and that's because when you SSH or SSL VPN in, it needs to give you an IP. So we're going to go ahead and say this is our SSL RAVPN pool. Starting address 192.168.100.2192.168.100.254. You just need to make sure you don't use the network or the broadcast address. And then give it a proper mask. Hit OK. Next, name resolution servers. That's the local DNS servers. Not super important, but OK. Um, and that is the DNS server on the outside. So actually, if you're remote accessing into the inside subnet, you want to have DNS on the inside. And I know we can't configure this in AWS, but the idea is if you stood up something, you would point to your DNS server on the inside. My inside subnet is dot two. So I'm gonna use two dot two, which is Amazon's DNS server on the inside. NAT exempt, I do not want this to be exempt from NAT. And the idea is when you think about the route tables in AWS, 
Uh, currently, that inside subnet can only talk to inside subnets, and it only knows where inside subnets are, i.e. the route tables and the security groups and network ACLs only allow local communication. So we're not going to exempt this traffic from NAT. Okay, that has just pushed and configured my AnyConnect RAVPN. Now, the one key thing that I talked about and we haven't configured is that NAT. So I've set it up so the traffic won't be exempt from NAT, but we are currently not NATing. So I'm gonna click on firewall down here, click on the NAT rules, and then add a rule. And what we're gonna to want to do is say, whenever anything comes from the outside, destined for the inside, we want to do PAT, and we want to make the source address on the inside the inside interface. So now I've got outside coming to inside, which is what the SSL RAVPN traffic is. I want to NAT it from the inside interface to wherever it's going. Click OK, click Apply, click Send, click Save, click Send. We have now just configured SSL Remote Access VPN on this ASA in quite a fast at quite a fast pace. So let's jump out of this now and let's go act like we're a new user that's never touched this device before. I'm gonna go ahead and take my outside interface, which means I need to come down here to the network interfaces. I wanna to go to my outside interface, my elastic IP on the outside. I'm just gonna use that versus the DNS name. It's just easier for now. I'm gonna go HTTPS colon slash slash paste this in here and hit enter. Now, if I configured everything correctly, this should allow me to reach into the ASA and then download. Okay, so my access didn't work. I probably need to check something here. Let me come back to these. And the first thing I'll do is I'll check my security groups. Oh, it looked like we were already there. All right, one second. Let's see, my outside security group. Let me check my rules, inbound rules, SSH. You, oh, here's my mistake. So I, I, when I initially configured this for you guys, I was thinking about allowing the SSL RA VPN and I was thinking more along the lines of IPsec. So I set it to UP and the reality is that is not UDP, it is TCP. So let's come back up, change this to TCP, save rules, update it. And now let's try this again. So let's HTTPS, there we are. So I'm now at the web page. Admin. And it is serving me up the ability to install AnyConnect. I hit OK. Now I've already got it installed. Again, I'm going to run through everything. Hit Next. Hit Repair. It's already there. I'm just going to run it again. Automatically close what already exists. Perfect. All right, so now I'm going to come down and I'm going to fire up my AnyConnects. Let's hope I didn't get something else wrong. All right, I'm going to take that same outside public IP that I put into the browser, and that should be serving up my SSL RA VPN, hence why I'm not using UDP 4500 and 500. So let's get rid of this. Hit connect. Oh, that's good. That means I hit something. Let's hit connect. There it is. That's our SSL VPN. All right. It says I've connected my VPN. One thing I want to check is we'll check route details. 0000. That's great. That means every packet is being funneled inside of this VPN connection. So I should now be able to start up my command prompt CMD type ping. 10.02.1. This is the virtual router on AWS, and that proves that I now have reachability behind the ASA. Now, if I want to go somewhere else, 10.0.1.0, ping, I'll ping the virtual router on the outside, and of course, it fails. And the reason it fails is because my default route for all my packets, everything is going into the VPN, it gets to the backside, and that subnet, remember if we look at our build out, only knows how to get to local subnets. I did not add a default route to the route table. This proves that my VPN is working properly. Now, we went through a lot here, guys, and even though I've done this a few times, I still made a few mistakes. 
this can get very hairy. It just takes a, a logical mind to walk through things when you make mistakes. I saw, for example, that I wasn't able to reach the web page. Security groups is the only thing I had configured so far that limited access, and I found that I accidentally set it to UDP versus TCP. These are perfect examples of how this seemingly quick configuration can be very complex and why all of this naming is proper. So hope you guys find this video useful. You saw how to install ASAV in AWS, how to configure security groups, how to configure elastic IPs, how to configure network interfaces, uh, instances, route tables, all of that, and all of it matters. So have a good one, guys. Enjoy installing ASAV in AWS.